Welcome to the Hillsboro Seventh Day Adventist Church. It's great to see a bunch of folks in the pews, and I know there are some watching at home. We're glad to have you with us as well. Um, we're going to start off this morning with some songs. Um, the pastor is is um, dealing with Daniel seven today in the sermon, and that's kind of that's one of. Um, Daniel's signature visions, but it's also, um, there's a section of that uh, chapter that talks about, you know, praising God and that sort of thing. So we've got a little bit of both. Um, Nine Ear Greaves is, is joining us this morning. We're going to start with um, Watch Ye Saints, which is number 598 in the hymnal. And this was written in 1844, um, apparently um, um, in, in response to um, William Miller's uh, um, projections about uh, prophecy. Um, we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4 today. Let's turn over now, if you have your hymnals open, to uh, number 82, um, Before Jehovah's Awful Throne. Verses 1, 3, and 4.
think a guy who spent most of his life in Southern California would be able to accommodate the warmth a little better. <laughs> but, oh man, uh, there's just not enough sagebrush up here to support this kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> all right, I think our last one is 103, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I had a marker, but never mind. <laughs> oh, God, our help. Um, this is, I don't know, it, it's just a kind of a wonderful prayer. Thanking God for his help in the past and seeking his guidance in the future. And um, since this is kind of our opening song, I'd ask you all to stand with me and let's sing. Let's do verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. everyone. How are we today? Good morning. Good morning. It's relatively cool in here, right? Yes. I mean, as long as we're not active doing work, you know. All right. So I have uh, what I think is an awesome story to share with you guys today for Mission Focus. So there was a young lady um, and she was looking for work. Um, she's still in the National Guard but she was looking for work and she was hired by a company out here in Oregon. When, before she joined the National Guard, she um, was 18 years old and she started attending an Adventist church at the age of 18. Um, and she attended, you know, for a little while and then she joined the National Guard. Um, and then, like I said, she got hired out here um, by a company. Um, when she moved out here, it was right in the middle of COVID. So, um, but her company still required them to go into the office to work. So she was going into the office and she found herself being bullied and she was really unhappy. Um, so she also found herself really missing out on church and she wanted to somebody to come do Bible studies with her. So I'm not sure the program that she used, but she watched a program, an Adventist program, and called the helpline. Um, and that number goes to a phone number in uh, Berrien Springs, Michigan at Andrews University. It's called AIM, I think it's Adventist Information Ministries. And they are, um, they take all the calls for these people. Well, she called and she says, I want Bible studies. And so um, she got a letter in the mail with a card attached to it. So she filled out a card and she sent it in and somehow something got lost. And so she called again, I want Bible studies. And for almost a year, this woman, young woman was reaching out for Bible studies. She was becoming pretty desperate. And finally, um, we got an email here at the church 
and it, it was addressed to Pastor Danny and the Hillsboro SDA Church. But as Bible worker, I answered it, and I said, um, absolutely, we're more than happy to do in-person Bible studies with this young person. Send me her contact information. So about another week went by, and I got her contact information, and I called her. She didn't answer the phone. So I was in the process of sending her an email when she called me back. I just got a phone call from this number. I said, yes, I was trying to reach out to you. And so I told her who I was and what I was doing, and she was so excited. Um, she goes, can we start this week? And I says, you know what? I think I have the perfect person. Let me make a phone call, and I'll call you right back. Will you be there? And she goes, oh, yes, I'll be here. So I called Nine Ear. And because nine year after my last time asking for people to come help me giving in giving Bible studies, she approached me and said that she prayed about it and felt that God was impressing her to help me. So I called her and I says, hey, I've got someone I think will be perfect for you. And so I gave her a little bit of the information and she says, sure. So I sent her the woman's contact, and I called the woman back, and I told her, this woman, Nine Ear, is going to be contacting you, and I gave her Nine Ear's contact information as well. Uh, they met that week. It was, I think, two days after that when, on Wednesday when they met, and um, three hours of conversation. And then I felt impressed, and I contacted her, and I said, you know, would you like to go out to lunch? And she says, absolutely. So I took her out to lunch on Thursday. And you know what? She says, I haven't had a hug in so long. And she goes, I was asking my coworkers, and the place where she was being bullied, she quit. And so she was asking her coworkers for um, hugs, and they would not, they would laugh at her. And she goes, I had to quit there. It was horrible. So now she's kind of between jobs, but she is and still in the National Guard. So that's where she is actually today. She has started coming to our Tuesday night Bible study as well. And she is continuing Bible study with Nine Ear. She is absolutely excited and she can't wait to come to church. So we need to pray for her. Her name is Shantia. And um, she is very excited. She says, I don't have anybody here I don't know why I'm in Oregon. I says, well, you now have a Hillsboro Church family. So I am really thrilled. I want to mention to you guys, though, that I still need people to help me with Bible studies. And you will not be doing it on your own because I have a box to give you. And if you're willing to do Bible studies, you can choose. It is written or amazing facts. I have either one. And so you will have your own box where you have your own lesson to go through, and then you will give the one lesson at a time to the person you're studying with and go through the lessons with them. It makes it super, super easy. And then if you have questions you can't answer, you can always talk to me or Pastor Danny or Pastor Victor. You know, any of us can help you answer the questions. That if, and if you can't, don't know something, just say, I don't know, but I will find out. Now, the other thing I also want to share is we have Bible studies for kids. We actually have two children doing Bible studies right now. We have um, little brochures, for the, a little booklet for prophecy for kids, but we also have um, both amazing facts and it is written Bible studies for kids. So if anybody's interested in that, please let us know. Um, Pastor Victor is going to be giving a Bible study to um, a young man who is 11 years old. So I just want you to keep us in your prayers. We are growing. Um, we have more and more interest. I did speak with another woman who is interested in our stuff, but she kind of wanted non-denominational. And so I told her, well, our Bible studies are strictly out of the Bible. They're out of God's word. We don't use any denominational stuff in it, right? Because as Adventists, we only follow God's word. So um, she will contact me back. She get, has my contact information, so we need to pray for her because she has a friend that both of them want to study Bible together. So I ask you to keep us in prayer. And if anybody is interested in helping out and giving Bible studies, please come let me know. Thank you. Amen. 
Hello, boys and girls. I have a special surprise. So if you guys want to come and sit down in front of me and we'll have children's story. Oh, and the stairs. So who likes puppies and dogs here? Can you raise your hand? Yeah, I love dogs and puppies too. So at my house, I actually have two dogs. I have one white dog, her name is Sugar, and an orange dog, her name is Piper. And something my family likes to do for fun is that we breed dogs and we have litters of puppies. Do you guys like puppies? I like puppies a lot, so it's a really fun thing to do. And so um, before we got Piper, we used to sugar, and so sugar was mom to three litters, and one of our litters that we had was 11 puppies, and so that was our biggest litter, and it was really, really hard to keep track of, and so um, when you have puppies, puppies are really they're like little hot dogs, we say, and they don't really move. And so it's kind of nice for us because the mom dog does all of the cleaning and the puppies just sleep and eat all day. And so it's really easy. But around four or five weeks, the puppies start to grow legs. And so um, the puppies then start to run around and we have to let them out in the yard because it gets kind of crazy because the puppies just want to run around and meet everybody all the time. So I have a story about one of the puppies that Sugar had in the litter. And so we would have to take the puppies outside in our backyard. And so part of that is that we a Frenston yard and a really big deck. And so it was really nice to just let the puppies go back. And we didn't really have to worry backyard was all fenced in. So one day, our family was just in the kitchen. We were just kind of relaxed. We're all running around just like kind of like a day like this. It was a really nice summer day. And our mom dog, Sugar, started acting really funny. She started to run back and forth and she started to bark. And we're like, oh, it's okay. She probably just needs to go to the restroom. So we just let Sugar out and we let her go and do her thing. And so we didn't really think much of it, but then Sugar started to run all over the yard, start to bark and act really crazy. We're like, what's going on? Why is she acting like this? And so we went outside and we, something that we need to do is count all the dogs and the puppies to make sure they're all there. So we went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, oh, and we couldn't find the 11th one. And we're like, okay, maybe we miscounted. There is a lot of dogs. So we started to count again, and we can only find 10 puppies, but we needed 11 puppies. And so we started our entire family, me, my mom, my dad, my brother, all started to run around the yard trying to look for the dogs. So sometimes they like to crawl underneath our deck, so we looked under there, and there was no puppy. And we started, and Sugar started to go in circles until she stopped at this one little weedy part in our fence. So, like I said before, we thought our yard was fenced, but we went into the little part that Sugar was really barking at, and we realized there was a hole in the fence. And we we're like, oh, we didn't know that there was a hole here. <laughs> and so, when we looked past the fence, we saw that the puppy had walked out there and fell through the hole, and there was a little ledge. And so, the puppy was stuck between the ledge, and there was a fence because we had a little sewage part be behind our yard. And so we were really glad that we found our puppy, but we needed to do our puppy rescue. And so my brother, thank you. <laughs> and so my brother and my dad got a ladder. And so we, they hopped over the fence and grabbed our puppy and all was good. We found our puppy. She was a little stressed, but it was okay because we found her. 
And so when I think about this story, I think about how Sugar really made sure that she wanted to find her last dog, you know? That was all of her babies. And she was really, really determined, even though she had her 10 dogs, she needed to find that one last dog. And if it wasn't for her, we wouldn't have known because her ears are a lot better than ours and her nose is really, really, really keen. And so we couldn't have find that, found that dog if it wasn't for Sugar and she was the one who told us. And so there's actually a story that's very similar in the Bible to this. It's a parable of the lost sheep. And in Luke 15, 3 through, five, three through 7, it says, Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and family together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who, did not, who do not need to repent. So just like how Sugar loves all of her puppies and she'd leave our 10, we have a shepherd in heaven that actually loves us so much more. And even, he even had 100 sheep in this story and he left all 99 just to find that one. So I want you guys to remember that even when you're lost and in trouble, God cares about you so much that he's going to always find you out of trouble and he's always going to try to, you know, look for you in the end. So I'm going to pray, then after our prayer, I'll bring our special surprise in today. So everybody close your eyes, bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you for being our shepherd in heaven, and thank you for caring and loving for us so much. Please bless these boys and girls today and help them to love you and to pray every single day. Thank you for the Sabbath day. And thank you for the sunshine in the sky. In your name I pray, amen. Okay, so if Marcus wants to come in, I actually brought a puppy here today. Wow, so Piper actually had six puppies. It's a little less than 11. But we have a little puppy here today that goes along with my story. So if you guys want to come in a line, we can all meet the puppy. This is Juniper, guys. So this is Juniper, everyone, <laughs> part of the story. She wasn't lost, so that was good. <laughs> so everybody, if you guys want to pet her, you can. Go ahead, you can touch her. Yeah? Oh, really? It's okay, she's pretty gentle. Good morning, happy Sabbath. It's great to see all of your smiling faces. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Wally. And just to, yeah, Teresa talked about those Bible studies and, and is looking for volunteers, but I will tell you from personal experience, the blessing is all yours when you, when you do that, when you go out and, and reach to other people. And it, it isn't scary. Uh, it really is. It really is a very pleasant experience when you let the Holy Spirit work in you. This morning, uh, those who would like to kneel for prayer, please, uh, please kneel and we'll...
Kind and loving Heavenly Father, we, we come before you today praising your holy name and thanking you. You've given so much to us, the gift of your son, Jesus, who's through his blood takes away our sin and, uh, and reconciles us to you so that we can, we can be in harmony with you. It's wonderful. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to empower the life of Jesus in us as we go about your mission in this world. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. We want to be rid of our human natures, our, our faulty characters, and your Holy Spirit will replace that with your character of self-sacrificing love. May your Holy Spirit be in this family and empower them in its young and its old, from, from our babies to our oldest. We need to be... We need to have you in us, empowering our lives. Lord, you are the source of all healing. And Lord, we have members that need healing. This COVID has, has really struck some of our members very, very hard, and, and they're still dealing with it. And we pray that your healing hand will be on them. Lift them up and bring them comfort. It is, your, it is through you that you comfort us. And Lord, we pray that you would give us understanding and wisdom as we work with each other and as we work in the community. May you be seen in this family in kind words and in loving fellowship. Lord, may you be seen in its service at every level in this church. So many of our members are, are managing all the different departments in the, in the church. And Lord, they're ministers in what they are doing. And they need your Holy Spirit in you to make that service meaningful. Lord, we, may you be seen in our community as we fulfill your mission. We also especially pray that your Holy Spirit will be in our pastors, in Pastor Victor as he works with our youth. And Lord, in Pastor Danny. May the words that he brings to us today be from you, Lord. We pray this in the name of the Father and in the name of your Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, I still remember in August, or actually in July of last year, and the conference told me I'll be going to Hillsborough Church. And I said, I think I remember driving by there. And then I drove by and uh, drove by the church. I said, what a wonderful church. And we got to come into this church building, and uh, I said, wow, this is a great building we have here to worship. And um, there are still places and cracks and crevices, little things that I'm learning about this church still. Like today, I learned there's a fan switch back there, Dave. And thank, thank goodness we have these little fan switches, right? Um, there is still one part of the church building that we are not using yet, and I want to make sure that we use. Um, there's a tank back there. there it's, it's a beautiful glass, which we just covered now. But there's a tank back there, and that's a baptismal tank. Um, I... There's nothing that really gives me goosebumps or as much joy as when I see people choose to follow God. It's a big step. It's trying to dedicate, dedicate themselves to God. It's a huge step. And then if you, any one of us, have an opportunity to lead someone to Christ, there is no greater honor, really. There's no greater honor 
to help people uh, learn more about Jesus. It's just, that's what we do. It's just so wonderful. And so to Teresa's effect, in, 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 as she's a Bible worker, and I told her this specifically, I don't want you doing all the Bible studies. That's not your job as a Bible worker. Your job is to coordinate, get church members involved, get people involved, because all you guys can do it. We, we, we'll try to make it as easy as possible. We'll train you. Because we want you to enjoy part of that joy of leading others to Christ. And it is truly a joy. So let us pray and let's begin our sermon today. I just pray, Father, for your spirit to lead us uh, and guide us and bless us. We want to thank you for this day and opportunity to listen to your words. We pray in your name. Amen. Daniel chapter 7. I, I don't have enough time to you this morning to give a full presentation of Daniel chapter 7. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a prophecy that's it's well known by some of you. And maybe to some of you, it might be not as well known. So I, I want to cover enough that we know what it's about. But there's are thoughts and ideas I wanted to hit more uh, about Daniel chapter 7. In our prophetic series we have in the fall, I'll go in more, more in depth. Because there'll be people, I hope, that have never heard about Daniel chapter 7. But to this group, I'm hoping that you already know Daniel 7. So we'll go to a quick review first. And that review starts right here. The four beasts that come out of the sea in Daniel chapter 7. We've already studied chapter 2. Remember chapter 2 and the great statue of Daniel chapter 2. And we we understood that there were four kingdoms in Daniel chapter 2. There were Babylon, Persia, there was Greece, and there was Rome. Well, what is interesting is that as we continue in the prophetic messages of Daniel, what's interesting about prophecy is that it, it focuses on a certain concept, then, then it narrows that focus. And in Daniel 7, it actually narrows the focus of prophecy and actually brings up another element to it, which are the little horn that comes up in the middle of Daniel chapter 7. So as we see the picture up here, we have the lion that represents Babylon. And then we know that after the lion, Babylon was conquered by another kingdom. And we have the bear that was lifted up on one side. The interpretation thereof means that the Medes were stronger. I don't know if you know your history, but the Medes were actually stronger. But then after, the Persians became the more dominant culture of this kingdom. It had three bones in its mouth depicting that it went three directions or it conquered three territories in conquering this vast land. We know that Median Persians also ended and it ended quite violently in historical facts because Alexander the Great, the great general, came and roaring and, and he's de- depicted by the wings that it was f- literally flying. And he said that the conquest of Alexander was quick, that he conquered vast territories that people didn't, understand, people didn't even see how quickly he had destroyed Persia. And he became the next great territory. And if you know history, that Alexander the Great died at a very early age. And when he died, he left his kingdom to four generals. And therefore, we had the four heads of the leopard. And finally, we see the last beast or monster that comes out of the sea and this beast is a terrible beast iron teeth had 10 horns and this teeth was demolished everything in its path and we know that after greece rome the roman empire the caesars had come into power and they ruled with an iron fist they conquered asia europe middle east uh, vast territories one of the greatest kingdoms to ever exist in the history of the world. And out of that comes the little horn. You can't see the little horn uh, on that picture, but there's one little horn up there that has a little mouth on it, little eyes on it, right in the middle. Uh, it's a little different. Uh, and we talked about how there's a little horn that, w- that came up out of this beast. And this beast talked blasphemies against the Most High and actually attacked the saints of the Most High. So in this depiction, we have the prophetic message of Daniel chapter 7. But what is the point of Daniel chapter 7? Because we have Daniel chapter 2. I believe intermixed with the message of Daniel 7 is another message. 
Another message is this, that there is an earthly kingdom, which we have here, but there's also a future kingdom, a godly kingdom. If you read Daniel chapter 7, and if your book, if your Bible has what I call regular lettering and what they call poetic lettering, you will see in your Bibles there are your, your, the, there are the parts of the Bible you read in 7 is actually very cubed-like. But there'll be other parts of Daniel chapter 7. It's very um, more sparse, okay? It's, it's more, there's more space. You'll see that if, you, if your Bible has that, okay? Um, it has a more of a dense print and more loose print, and you might see that. And if your Bible has that loose print, whenever it goes to loose print, what that's telling you is that it's poetic language. It's poetic language. That's why in Psalms, you'll have a lot of loose words, not all edge to edge like rest of the text. And what is interesting is if you look at Daniel 7, it's actually two visions in one. There's two visions going on. Now, we, we seem to concentrate on the one vision of the, of the beast because it kind of stands out. But there's actually another vision, to my opinion, a more important vision. And this vision is about the real kingdom. And what Daniel 7 is really doing is not just highlighting the earthly kingdoms. It's highlighting the comparison of the two kingdoms. A kingdom that will eventually disintegrate and a kingdom that will last forever. Counterfeit. Title of my sermon today. It's a noun. It means made in the exact imitation of something valuable or important with the intention to deceive or defraud. There is an eternal truth that we all need to understand. God is real. God is real. We live in a world where we question his existence. You know that. There are millions of people in this world who question his existence. And what God is saying, I am real. And not only that, the future is real. And I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show you by this. I'm going to show you what the fake world is. And I'm going to show you what the reality is. In our world today, there are Two realities. Two realities. One reality that we, are, we have to live in. One reality we get bills every month. One reality Hillsborough charges a lot of money for utilities. Okay? <laughs> that is one reality. But there's another reality. That all of this will disappear. That God is true. That there is a home for all of his children who want to go there. There is a fake and there is a real. When I was a child, my, my, we weren't very rich as a child. Um, we didn't have a lot of money. My parents were doing what they can to make sure that, uh, you know, we are fed and we had clothes on. And I, when I was a little kid, um, I went to school and all my clothes were Kmart specials. You guys, you guys remember Kmart? Good old Kmart, right? And that's where I got all my clothes. Yeah, I don't know, just, just clothes, right? Well, I went to this new school one day, and I had my Kmart clothes. And these other kids, like they always do, they looked at me and goes, what is that? You know, what are you wearing? And, you know, like, you know, and they have these old fashioned things, you know, what they, you know, and, and because I wasn't wearing the proper fashion, I was like, oh, Danny is just one of those weirdos, you know. And I came home feeling really bad, you know. I was like, mom, kids are making fun of me because I have funny clothes. And she felt bad. And, and the big popular brand in the 80s, 70s, 80s, was Nike. Okay? You know, all the kids had Nike shoes. Well, my mom can't afford Nike shoes. They were like 40 to 50 bucks. That's a lot of money for shoes. She, especially me, as a boy, I go through shoes like, like nothing. I'm running around, right? But my mom felt really bad. So she went to Kmart, and she did the next best thing she could do. She found shoes that kind of looked like Nikes. 
okay? And she bought me these, the upside down Nikes, <laughs> all right? So um, I remember she came home and she got all excited and she brought that box and she gave me these Nikes and I put them on. I didn't, I didn't really understand it, really. You know, it looked like Nikes. And I put them on. And I was so excited. I got brand new shoes. I went to school. Oh. <laughs> the kids were looking at me. They're looking at my shoes. They go, nice new shoes, Danny. I go, okay. I sense a little sarcasm. And then all the kids start whispering and talking. And they start laughing at me. And they go, Danny, those aren't Nikes. Those are fake Nikes. I was like, fake Nikes? Yeah, look at mine and look at yours. And, I, and it dawned upon me, I had, my swoosh was upside down. I, I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh, and all the kids are laughing at me again. You know, my, my wife says, I, I, I was so traumatized by that. I was like, now I have to wear name brands. I'm like, all right, fine, maybe. Um, fake. Fake means an imitation of the true. There is a true God. Because it says in Hebrews 6.18, that by two immutable things in which there is an impossible for what? God to lie. We might have to be strong in consolation. We have fled the refuge and lay hold upon the hope that is set before us because God doesn't lie. It is immutable. If God says to you and says, you are a rock. Listen for a second. You say, well, I'm not a rock. Okay, here, oh, turn me out. If God calls you a rock, guess what? The next moment he says that, you will become a rock. Do you hear what I said? Because God is truth. And if he speaks it, it becomes fact. It's a pretty powerful God, right? That's how God works. He is true. He cannot lie. He cannot lie. He could only tell the truth because there is only one truth. Do you understand? There is one truth. There is nothing else but the truth for God. It is fact. Whatever he says, whatever he does, whatever he is, is the truth. And if God tells us there is a heaven, it is fact. It is not conjecture. It is not wishful thinking. It is, it is not, I hope there is a heaven. There is no such thing. If God says there is a heaven, if there is a home, if there are angels, there are so. Yes? That's how God works. He works and deals with facts. We don't have to hope there is heaven. We don't have to hope there are angels. We don't have to hope there. No, if God said it, and if God said this, if it, Jesus says, I am coming back, in John 4, he says, I'm coming back, and that there's many mansions in heaven, with, in heaven. And if Jesus said those things, can I take that as a 100% fact? Absolutely. If I drive out tonight and drive out after church today and drive to my home, I believe there will be a house there. Hopefully it didn't burn down. But I believe there's a house there. I know there's a house there. I, I'll drive there believing there's a house there. You know, you know what I'm saying? There's no, well, I hope there's a house. No, there is. And if I look in the map and it says I'm driving to whatever, Boise, Idaho, I'll trust that map. When I get to that position, there'll be Boise, Idaho. And what Jesus, is, what God is saying is that he does not lie. And when God says there is a heaven, it'll be there. It'll be there. It can't not be there. So we have the other problem. We have what's called a father of lies. In John 8, it says, you belong, this is about Lucifer, you belong to your father, actually he's talking to the Pharisees. It says, you belong to your father, the devil, to you who want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning not holding the truth, for there is in him no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Understand something, that there is an enemy who is lying to us. Does that make sense to you? 
He is lying to you. He is lying to this world. What God is is fact. And what Lucifer has done is to confuse our world by lies. And so what I'm trying to understand when reading Daniel, what God is trying to tell us is that there is truth, there is realities, but understand something, there are lies. And they are a part of this world. The next part is going to be a little sketchy. We always fall for the lie, don't we? We always fall for the lie. Come on, Charlie. I'll hold the ball for you. I'll hold it right here for you. And you can be able to kick it. And Lucy just sits there with a smile, right? And we know, and we're looking at the cartoon going, don't do it, Charlie. Don't do it. And Charlie Brown, every single time, maybe this one time, the ball will be there. Maybe this one time, Lucy won't pick up the football. And what happens? You hear the sound, right? Ah! The sound that Charlie Brown makes, right? Ah! The sound he makes. And every single time, he goes flying in the air, and Lucy holds the football, laughing again. Charlie has fallen for the lie. In our world, we're thinking, it can't be that bad, could it? Could Lucifer be lying about everything? Maybe could, one thing could be true. The Bible tells us there is nothing that is true about Lucifer. Nothing. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, it says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, and there came like a son of man, and he became a, he came of the ancient days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, and all the peoples and nations and, and languages should serve him, his dominion and everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom are, are that shall not be destroyed. My brothers and sisters, what Daniel 7 is, is about this. He wants you in the kingdom that's what daniel 7 is about daniel 7 is yes we have prophecies about the false kingdoms but that's not the point of daniel 7 the point of daniel 7 is actually about the true kingdom do not be deceived do not be taken away by the false kingdoms that's what god is trying to say be the true kingdom he saw and the vision that daniel saw he saw the true kingdom he saw jesus on the throne he saw god the father and his holiness that is true and he's saying all the other stuff is fake we live in a fake society we live in a fake narrative you understand what I'm saying? Fake narrative? This whole concept of the American dream is fake. It's made up. Someone told you you should have the American dream, that you should have a house and a dog and whatever, play golf. And that's the American dream sold to you by the father of lies. That is not the point of the world. The point of the world is this. We're going home. That's why we're here. Not to make money. That's a lie. Not to retire when you're 65. That's a lie. The truth is what God says. And everything else is a lie. There's a book. I've never read this one, but I've read many books. Fake history. I am a history buff. I love history. I do. I really love history. Um, I'm not sure kids these days have that same passion about history, but history. Now, there's something interesting. I used to watch a show called The History Channel, a lot of history. But I realized something, because I'm studying, I study a lot of books. History Channel doesn't always tell you the truth. Do, do you realize that? The stuff in the History Channel, what I have found, most of it is conjecture. Most of it, it's kind of maybe happened. And they'll tell you that that happened that way. And when I read other books, and like, wait a minute, it, that, that's not true. Then I have two books saying two different things. I'm like, 
wait a minute, what's going on? I thought that was true. When I was young, I, like I said, I love history. I, I love encyclopedia. You remember me, me, Mr. Encyclopedia? I love that stuff. I love reading that stuff. And I thought, well, this is true. This is what happened. And now I'm reading other books. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. It didn't happen that way. It, it, people actually did things differently. And there's a quote. It says, history are written by the victors. You ever that quote? The history is written by the victors. And what that meant is that if you are Nazi Germany, you get to write history the way you want to write history. Because history creates narrative. It tells you where you came from. It tells you where you're going. And so if we live in a world that's not going to heaven, they need a narrative to tell you you're not going there. So you see, not only do we have fake history, we've created fake science. Do you realize the majority of the world believes we came from apes? I want you to think for a moment. Our world is so deceived, we think we came from apes. And they'll try to prove it to you. They'll say, this bone is 50 million years because there's carbon dating. You know what? God created carbon. Okay? And if God says that's 4,000 years old, guess what? It's 4,000 years old. If I'm going to trust science or God, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to trust God 100% of the time. I thought I was smart. I got a college education. Okay? I got a college education. And when I got a college education, I said, you know what? This Bible stuff, it's all whatever, fake You know, I thought this Bible stuff, ah, you can't really believe it. You know what? I was deceived. Could it be true that our colleges don't know what they're teaching? Could that be possible? Could it be possible our teachers don't know what they're teaching? To be honest with you, all they get taught is from other teachers, don't they? And I realized something, wait, and my head got kind of really a brain shift. Time out. You mean I can't trust history books? You got to take it with a grain of salt, Danny. You're, you mean you can't trust science? Danny, what is really science? Every 50 years, they change science. You know that? If you study your history books, facts change all the time. It's amazing how much science changes depending on who is telling you. And they're telling me I came from a monkey that we are just dinosaurs and they keep on creating new plans and new ideas and dark matter this because they can't explain that. There's so many holes to science and they keep on making up stuff because the more we learn, more stuff doesn't make sense. We are not created by monkeys. I read in Genesis, we were created by God. And if God says there were seven days in creation... There are seven days in creation. I am not ashamed, and I hope you're not ashamed of me. I'm your pastor, and I believe in a seven-day literal creation. That's what I believe in. But that's what the Bible tells me. The world might say, oh, it might be millions. No, no, God created the world in seven days, and I believe that. I believe that this world is only six days thousand years old. I believe that because God said so. And if I have to trust a book that some person created or the Bible in which God created, I'm going with the Bible. Because God cannot lie and the devil lies all the time. This has been a big topic of late. Fake news. We've got fake news all over the place. Left, right, this and that. You know, whew, I read the news, I'm like, it's kind of hard these days. Because I read it, I'm like, what are they saying? And what bothers me is that the one group will say this, and one group will say that, and I'm like, when did all our news become propaganda? When did that happen? I just like, I'm scratching my head. Wasn't there a time there was Reuters and AP that kind of just said facts? Like, oh, by the way, we need to pray for Miami. It's true. A building did collapse. 
and there are 100 people still missing. Uh, that's 100 families that are torn up today. And that did happen. Okay? And I don't need news to tell me whatever. And we need to pray for that. That's tragic. And uh, there's a lot of tragedies in this world. But what I'm finding is that there's news has changed over in, a, in my lifetime. I'm not sure about yours. I'm not sure what's happened. It isn't just facts anymore. It's like, this is why you should believe this or why you should think that. And like, I don't need you to tell me what I should believe in. Just give me just whatever happened and I'll make up my own mind. Is, is that fair? That's all I really want from news, right? Just tell me the news. I don't need your opinions. I don't need you to tell me what should I believe. Just tell me what happened and I'll deal with it. But what bothers me the most, though, is that uh, my daughter and my son, I'm really worried because there's applications and there's these things called cell phones. I'm getting nervous. There's things called Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat, TikTok. I can't even keep up. There seems to be a new application every year. And what scares me is that when I see a 13-year-old, they start believing things, not because of facts, but because there are people telling them what to think. Do you hear me? And I'm, I'm really worried. I'm really worried. Because almost every 13-year-old has that thing in their face. Okay? And that, that social media is is telling them this is what you should believe, this is how you should be outraged or you should be happy. And as a pastor, I find this highly, highly fear-based. It's, 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 it's changing us. And I worry when our 13-year-olds become 18-year-olds. Um, I worry when they become 30-year-olds because they have learned not to think they just learn to accept what the majority is being taken in. And when they tell you that God is not here, they will believe that. And when they tell you that Christianity is pointless, they will believe that. Not because they've thought it through, because someone told them to believe that. And let's go to this in our boob tube. It makes you a boob. It just vegetates you. You sit and listen to whatever they tell you to believe in. Hollywood, my friends, is not entertainment. I want to let you, let's get this across, okay? Let's please understand this. Hollywood, Disney, Paramount, Universal, all these companies is not entertainment. Do you understand this? It's not a movie to be entertained. It's not a good story. It is no such thing. All of our movie houses are owned by people who work for the evil powers of this world. Yeah. Do you hear what I said? There's a liar in this world, and his name is Lucifer. And he runs that show. He runs this show. And all our movies and all our entertainment... I need you to watch with filtered eyes. Am I saying not to watch TV? Okay, I'm not going to say that because I watch TV. I watch Home Channel. I got some good design ideas for bathroom. Yeah. Kind of expensive ideas. I like Food Channel because I like to eat. That could be a problem for some of us. Okay? So there are some things I do. Oh, my wife is watching some um, gold digging. She thought it was kind of cool. Alaskan gold digging is like, that's interesting. Why are you up there 40 degrees below? looking for gold, but that's what I want to do, but that was interesting, right? So there are TV I do watch, but I want to say we need to understand what we're looking at, okay? And movies are not entertainment. There's a, there's a, a producer that made a quote, and it just it stuck with me. He says, every movie is a sermon. It's a sermon. There's a message behind what they want to say, and they wrap it around a movie, because we like stories. We're, we are narrative, you understand? People are narrative. We, we, we are a story. 
Jesus created us to be part of a, a grand story. Okay, he did. And when we watch movies, it, we like that story. But the problem is, when we watch the worldly stories, we believe their narrative. We believe their ideas. And trust me, it starts from a wee little age from Disney and goes all the way up. Be careful of what we're taking in. Okay? And I think, that, to me, I'm honest, the children movies are the worst because kids have no filter. They have no ability to say, that's not right. And they just take it in. The indoctrination begins. And you wonder why at 18 they don't believe in God anymore. Mm. To be honest with you, I don't believe it's because we have our bad schools. To be honest with you, I think Adventist schools are great. We have some wonderful teachers. But they can't compete against Hollywood. They can't compete against Cartoon Network and MTV and music videos. They can't compete against that. But the indoctrination is powerful. I'm going to hit this guy a little bit. If you don't recognize him, that's the Pope. And um, to be honest with you, he's kind of an easy target. Let's be honest. He's kind of, if you look at this, frankly, it's kind of an easy target, okay? He, hold, he has a pagan Egyptian hat on. He's wearing pagan clothes. That's as a pagan thing. He's hold, everything he's holding and doing is pagan. I, there's almost nothing here that's Christian except for maybe the title Christ, okay? Uh, and then we, we know this to be true because we know in Daniel 7 that not only does the lies stay in the world, it seeps into Christianity. And this is kind of, I'm hitting some tough ground here. Do you understand that lies has come into the church? Is it possible? Could it be possible that the, that the, the most powerful Christian church of the world has no Christianity left in it? This is a danger that I see in our world today. That if we don't know our Bibles, if we don't study the truth, the truth will be told to us. The truth will be shared to you. And you will believe what the world tells you to believe. And my friends, I have a big problem with that. As a pastor, it is not my job to tell you the truth. You hear me? My job is to share with you the truth, yes, but then it's your job to understand that truth. Yes? If it's just Pastor Danny sharing my knowledge or my vision or my understanding, then we have a problem here. Because it can't be about me. What I do want you to understand is that if we rely on sources, even the church... Now, this is an easy target. On the next picture, you might not like the next one. Okay? This talk, this one. You seen these before? The one on the right or the one on the left is a steeple. The one on the right is the Washington Monument. Okay, I'm a history person. Remember that. I actually looked up what these things are because that's who I am. I'm a curious person. I, don't, I, just can't think, I just can't let things go. So I start digging and, and researching and whatnot. The common idea is that, that they're both the same. Both these are the same. Both are pagan ritual statues. I, don't, I won't even go deeper than that one. I, I'll keep it right there for this audience. Okay, you could dig on your own, um, but both the same. Well, what's interesting is that the Washington Monument is a landmark in Washington, D.C. It's, it's just sitting there. There's a big old pole sitting there. And we're like, oh, cool, the Washington Monument. And no one asks, why is it there? And no one asks, what does that mean? I'll let you guys figure that one out. And the other one, it's in churches everywhere. It's in churches everywhere. And if you look at the Old Testament, they talk about poles, high places. You ever, you read Old Testament? Read Kings and Chronicles. It talks about poles and worshiping poles and Asherah poles and whatnot. It's been part of pagan religion for millennia. Well, guess what? We're still worshiping under poles. Okay, we just call them steeples now. That's a better name, steeples. We Christian churches have steeples. We 
Adventist churches have steeples. I'm not saying we're devil worshipers. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is we are, we, we, we are doing things. We have been taught things. And many times we don't even question things. And my brothers and sisters, when it comes to this world, we got to question everything. When it comes to the Bible truth, I, I will believe it 100%. Okay? When it comes to the Bible truth, it is true. God said it. I believe it. It is true. So that's what I'm, so like I said, if you disagree with me, I'm sorry, but I believe the Bible is true. I, I, I won't go back. I won't. Because I've seen the world. I've seen what the world teaches. I'm not going back. I'm not. But whatever the world tells me anything, I question everything. I'm sorry. I'm a skeptic. When it comes to the world, I am a skeptic. When it comes to God, God is everything. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is everything to me. Do you understand? This, this is not just a saying. This is not something Jesus just said casually. This is everything to us. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Jesus is everything. He is my guide. He is my compass. He is my way. He is my truth. He is my future. He is everything to me. I can't trust the world. I've become too cynical. That's what facts does to you. Solomon says, be careful of books. It makes you cynical. It wears on your bones. And I think it has worn on my bones a little bit. But Jesus is the truth. He's the way. And he's the life. In Daniel 7, 11, it says, I beheld... And then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. This, what Daniel's trying to say is that this world is 100% sandcastle. 100%. Everything in this world is 100%, will not be here, will not survive, will be, be completely gone. There's a nice, beautiful sandcastle, but let's not forget, there's a huge ocean behind it. And no matter how pretty this world creates sandcastles, that ocean will come. This world tries to design a world, a narrative, a story for us to live in. That's what he has done. We live in a fake universe, in a fake world. But God is saying, truth cannot be changed. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, it says, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. You know what the childish thing is? This world is a childish thing. This world without God makes no sense at all. Our great education, our universities of learning are all childish things. The truth is Jesus Christ. This world is not what truth is. God is truth. Reality, this is reality. Three things will last forever. This is the New Living Translation. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. My friends, this is the reality of Jesus. That this world will all one day fade away, but this truth will never end away. Jesus is a reality. Jesus is the one we will be with forever. And my friends, this is why we're here. We are escaping that norm into this norm. And when we become what Jesus wants to become, he has a place for us. The reality in Jesus Christ. Let us not be deceived by the world. The world, I ache for the world. I do. I ache for this world because the blinders are so powerful. 
our music, our food, our entertainment, our cars, our homes, our money, our marriage, everything has become a lie until Jesus makes it true. And my friends, this is why we're here. We are people who want to follow the truth, who seek the truth. Do I know the truth? No, that's not why you come to me. Jesus knows the truth. And that's why we're here. Because we want to learn more about Jesus. And I believe that's what Daniel 7 is talking about. The fake will disappear, but the truth will remain forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for this message you presented us this morning. That this world will one day disappear, but your words will never disappear. This world will fade into nothing, nothingness, but your eternity will last for all of time. I just pray, Father, that as we, your children, might not be caught up with the fake, but be caught up with the truth that is in Jesus. Be with us, encourage us, and strengthen us, and give us hope and wisdom, and give us love. We thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.